I'm so grateful um, that we had the opportunity to do the work that we're going to preview to you here today and release uh, in full next week. Um, I'm going to get right into it and just give you about 10 minutes, if I can, of background here in terms of what this thing is and wh what it hopes to accomplish. Let me start by uh, pointing out that you know the topic of reform in China is not new. It, it is the singular element of China's development strategy over the past half century. Uh, the other major East Asian economies, the dynamos that we knew, um, didn't really proceed with reform as the touchstone. They were taking great opportunities to put their labor forces to work and all that sort of thing within the American security umbrella. China had to make a very different decision from 1978 going forward. They had a, a, a system fundamentally incompatible with their own efficiency, their own opportunities, and had to make a long and continuing series of brave and bold choices about policy reform in order to unlock what they could contribute for themselves uh, and ultimately to the world. Um, and so this is something we've been talking about a long time, um, but for a nation of 1.4 billion people, now uh, about $12 trillion uh, of world economic activity, um, the job is far from done, uh, and there are you know, massive consequences and implications of how that progresses now going forward. There's two quotes up on the screen, one from Deng Xiaoping in 1992, after the, uh, the detour of the Tiananmen Square uh, debacle, um, noting that China's future and its, uh, and its outlook depended entirely on getting back to reform and opening up of the economy, of the system. And if the country did not do that, then the party and the state and the people would find themselves in a blind alley, which is the Chinese for dead end, um, not where you want to be uh, when you have the kinds of challenges and realities that a, a nation of China's size has. In 2015, fast forward decades later, um, uh, Premier Li Keqiang, in conversation with a Western journalist, made quite clear that he understood that the implications of whether China gets it done, gets the job, the reform job done or not, um, are not just um, super critical to the interests of the Chinese people, um, but to everyone worldwide, that everyone has a stake in China's success and the character and the quality of the reform program that China undertakes. And he so much as invited uh, Western scholars um, to join in the process of evaluating and taking stock of the nature and quality of China's reforms at home and its implementation of its own comprehensive economic reform program that was laid out in 2013. Therefore, in 2015, uh, Josette, uh, Kevin, uh, and the rest of us decided to um, start down the path toward this tr tracking uh, program, trying to come up with indicators that could be shared and mutually uh, employed um, by Chinese analysts, Western analysts, and others to have a shared sense of what the Chinese trajectory is rather than just reacting to short-term data points all the time that may or may not tell us what's really happening here um, in the grand arc, um, as, uh, as Jeanette, uh, I think Josette said. There's, I'm not sure if you can see all the bars on this chart, but China and the global economy today versus the year 2000, um, the first two bars in yellow there are China's population share of the planet, just about 20 percent and relatively stable over that 15-year period. Uh, the next uh, sets of bars um, describe China's trade share in the world, going from, in the year 2000, uh, about 3.9 and 3.4 percent of global exports and global imports, up to today's share in the vicinity of 13.5 uh, 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 percent, or 14 percent of global exports, 10 percent of global imports. The point there is that these are gargantuan changes and structural adjustments that have happened in the trade space. And we think of China as this globalized entity, we're mostly thinking about trade, because China has, to a great extent, globalized in terms of its trade footprint. That has brought the just huge adjustment pressures that have uh, shaped the American political conversation over the past decades and European, um, elsewhere in the world as well. It's also brought the opportunities that there's so much uh, new comparative advantage changing between economies around the world. So that has given us a sense of just how important these Chinese adjustments in policy can be, that it can shock the world in terms of the trade dimensions. But at 
14 and 10 percent of global exports and imports, with China being 20 percent, roughly, of world population, it tells us there's still quite a lot of shock, even in the trade space, yet to come. We're not done accommodating China's normalization uh, to become uh, an advanced economy. Uh, like we have, such as it will be in the future. So plenty of more shock to come, and therefore we have to understand what's happening in the trade space. Um, but the other bars on the chart, over on the right-hand side, um, which are even harder to see, um, the first pair of purple bars is China's foreign direct investment flow footprint. As an inbound direct investment host, China got started pretty early. By 2000, it was already 3% of all global inflows were going into China. Today, that's just shy of 8% of all global flows. Still not as big as their population weight. We should expect to see a lot more global investment into China in the years ahead. We're not nearly done with that story. Even more shocking, the second pair of purple bars, which is outbound direct investment, which Josette and Jack both mentioned as kind of what got us started in Asia Society and Rhodium working together. In 2000, China was 0.1 percent of global outbound investment flows, one-tenth of one percent, coming from a nation of then 1.1 or 1.15 billion people. Today, that is just shy of 9 percent of all global outbound investment flows, and that is the shock of today, the same way that trade was in the early 2000s as we really started to appreciate how big an impact this was going to be. The final two pairs of bars there are portfolio investment flows, people putting their life savings into markets somewhere, not all just in one emerging market called China, if you're Chinese. And for us out here, wanting to have our pension funds and our savings somewhat deployed into China, which is where so much of the world's growth is going to happen in the decades to come. Um, before we need to start drawing down our pensions, pension accounts, those of us um, who uh, aren't on the cusp of, uh, uh, of doing so already. So, so much more to come. This tells us just why China was such a big reform question over the past decades and how we're not even really halfway through the story. So this is an urgent and germane question. How's the policy reform process going? We think about what the stakes are here we think of, you know, ask the question, what's China's GDP growth potential five years out from now or 10 years out from now? And there's, there's absolutely no consensus around this. Some people think five years from now, China is still going to be growing 6% a year. Well, multiply 6% growth on what will then be a 15 or an 18 trillion dollar economy and think about the enormity of the new market space created every year up to a trillion dollars of new opportunity for companies to participate in, for people to find jobs in, uh, in just a few years hence. On the other hand, there are those who look at the reform mix today and say if we don't get fundamental changes and work done, if we don't get the things done which Deng Xiaoping and then President Xi himself said just a few years ago, we got to get this done or we'll be in a blind alley. What does that mean? It means growth can fall, and China's not immune to recession. China's not immune to the consequences of not getting the policy mix right. Growth could be, in the worst case scenarios, 1% a year, five years from now. If, if this basic core work of getting the economic policy mix right is not effectively done in China uh, in the years ahead. So that brings us to the dashboard and what we're here to do. We all have a stake in having a clear idea of how's it going on that third plenum reform program that was so well crafted um, five years ago. We're at the midpoint now of the Xi Jinping era, and we all need to have a clear idea of it. If we don't have a clear and objective idea of how it's going, we're going to make policy choices. We're going to make decisions based on the sum of all of our fears and conjectures, hopes, aspirations, but not grounded in any sense of ob objectivity in terms of what's happening and what the implications of it are. So what Dashboard is, is an appraisal of the 10 core areas of policy reform that the Communist Party of China, led by General Secretary Xi and the rest of the leadership, drafted and put in place in 2013, using China's own definition of what it needed to get done and finding observable metrics that everybody can go out and find and look at for themselves to make sure they agree with the, how the data was put together 
to provide a very broad aggregate track measure for how this reform work is being implemented and, 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 uh, and made, to, uh, made to have effect. Not just looking at rhetoric, not just looking at policy commitments, but in every case looking for outcomes in the marketplace that demonstrate that the policies have had their intended effect. Um, there are 10 different channels on this dashboard. Um, that are made available, plus a net assessment that we're going to put on top of that each quarter for the foreseeable future. That's what um, people will be getting um, out of all this effort from us. I brought just two to share with you to give you a sense of what this looks like and what this means. Um, of the 10 different things we're looking at, which range from fiscal policy to domestic financial system reform to cross-border investment reform, the two I brought here first are innovation policy reform. Uh, for a more advanced economy, at the income level China has attained, the degree of innovativeness in the system is the principal driver of future economic growth and opportunity. It's no longer about just providing electric power and infrastructure and the things that India can still have another decade of growth just doing the basic stuff. China's pretty much done that. And going forward, the keys to the kingdom lie in innovation. We could look at all sorts of innovation policies like the number of patents filed every year, but that doesn't really settle the discussion, does it? Because you, there's different kinds of patents. There's different questions about how innovative those patents really are. So what we've done instead on innovation here, the yellow line at the bottom, we have defined those industries in China which are innovative industries. So we're not looking here at retail and wholesale which by and large doesn't generate a lot of new productivity and technological deepening and the things that economists look for when they're looking for innovation. Instead, we're looking at higher technology sectors, information and communication technologies, for example, advanced transportation systems. And we're looking at the overall value of those sectors of the economy relative to all industrial output. That tells us of everything China produces in the industrial sector, how much of it is in the industrial space and how much is socks and underwear, so to speak. And seeing that share of total output from the innovative set go up is proof positive. It ends the discussion of how China is doing in terms of where its output is coming from. You can see in that yellow line there at the bottom that we've had a very significant uptick um, in that share, especially over the past two years since 2015, was 30% of total Chinese output in the fr uh, second quarter of 2012. And by the way, for each of our uh, 10 areas we're looking at, we're going to use a five-year window to see what the trend lines are and the data we're looking at. Today, that's come up to uh, around 34, 33.8, 34% of all output. May sound like small differences to you, but it's actually very, very significant that that number is where it is. The reference lines, the dotted ones, are the same numbers for the United States, for the European Union in green, and for Japan in blue. So we're providing context, a reference point, so you can say, well, 33, what the heck does that mean? Well, this is what it means. It means that at this pace, China will surpass the share of innovative activity in the United States in about 18 months. Now, in the dashboard, which will be made live next week, there is a short 2,000-word textual analysis of that data and supplemental data to help flush out the story that raises the question, when we look at the details of the growth rate of this innovative share, is this really sustainable or is this really just the past two years that it's popped up and we should expect a cycle here where it starts to come down. So it's not just a year or two before we get to U.S. levels. Maybe it's five years or something like that. There's also a discussion of could something go wrong that could permanently impair China's progress toward that innovation share in the economy. And let me just point out as well that the innovation share is not the only thing that matters to us when we talk about Chinese innovation. We're also interested in fairness, whether there's IPR uh, theft going on, all these kinds of things that need to be discussed. And those are all valid questions. But our question for the dashboard is, is China demonstrating the kind of movement in each of these areas that will propel it toward high GDP growth for itself? 
What the implications are for everyone else is another long discussion that needs a good bottle of Jack's wine from his cellar um, back in California. We'll, we'll get to that, I hope, Jack, sometime soon. Two minutes, so I'll move fast then to, sorry? Oh, two bottles. Okay. <laughs> two bottles. <laughs> Much better than two minutes. Okay. So, uh, innovation. Um, let me, innovation, I, I put up the two that I'm showing you because when we look where we're going to come out next week, sort of what's going well and what's maybe going less well, innovation is on one end of the spectrum. The, the numbers are really moving in the right direction very quickly. Um, one that's not moving so quickly in the right direction is labor policy reform. Labor and shared welfare uh, is critical to China's long-term success. Um, if the nation's not investing in its people, if it's especially not bringing up the next 600 million who have done pretty well under reform but are still not able to get the kind of education and health care that will put China on a course to be South Korea in the future rather than on a course to be uh, Mexico, if you will, which is still struggling with tremendous social challenges to keep the country growing in the presence of too much poverty and urban um, unmet urban need, for example. So when we look at labor here and try to find some very broad proxy for how this is going, we're looking at the wage growth, quarterly wage growth, for migrant workers, the pool of people who are least empowered in China's society today, to see whether they're catching up to folks that have access to better health care, what we call urban huko rights, uh, which is uh, China's regulatory entitlement to education, health care, uh, all those kinds of services that urban Chinese have. Migrant workers, generally rural denizens, uh, don't have the same access um, to those uh, sorts of um, uh, uh, services as urbanites do. And then the orange line there shows us that migrant worker wage growth at present. The dotted line is China's GDP growth rate. So we now have uh, migrant worker wage growth, only 70% of the GDP growth level. So they're falling behind the rate of overall national GDP growth in the country. Um, the other lines, blue and green, lag a little bit because of data, but that gives us a sense of how employees at state-owned and foreign firms are doing in terms of their wage growth. They're moving pretty much in par with GDP growth, Migrant workers are just not seeing their wages rise right now, which says something needs to be addressed urgently to make sure China has the workforce of the future that will be consistent with that good news sort of 5 or 6 percent GDP growth story. Um, for each of these 10 clusters that we offer the reader a deep dive into, we start at the top of um, each of those sections, those clusters, with this primary indicator which is to say, look, this is complicated enough. We've got 10 different things you have to look at here to come up with a point of view about how China is doing. 10 times 10 primary metrics. If you can only have one for each of these, this is the one we think you should spend your time looking at and asking how can reform be on track if this line is not moving in the right direction. But for those who want to go deeper and flush out the story in each of these areas, we also have a run of supplemental uh, chart work and data material to help flush out the story. And for labor here, um, I've put up uh, just that primary uh, and beside it four supplemental charts, and I'll just give you a sense of what they are. The top one there is China's GDP growth rate. You can barely see it in the thumbnails, of course, uh, in green. And under it, the annualized rate of new job creation in the country using Chinese data that we think provides an, a an adequately reliable look at what the current rate of new job creation is overall. And you can see that presently um, it's lagging GDP growth quite seriously. That tells us that whatever GDP growth is happening in China right now, it's capital intensive growth. It's not labor intensive growth. It's the kind of investment activity that uh, builds new capital intensive facilities but doesn't necessarily create a lot of jobs. And that's very much a concern for labor policy. The second one is number of jobs uh, offered per applicant for jobs at provincial labor markets that have been created around the country, broken into the um, eastern region, the central region, and the west region of the country. We should be seeing uh, a better clearance of that market, more like one for one, in western China today, where so much of the marginal growth um, needs to be taking place. 
the third chart down, going down the list there is the quarterly performance of urban disposable income growth versus rural disposable income growth. So many of our labor stories connect with our hopes for Chinese consumption potential in the future. And that's why we need to look at a chart like that. And finally, at the bottom there, we have social expenditures by the government in China on the kinds of things that raise workforce productivity in the long term, health care, education, uh, and the like, um, to give us a sense of whether we're seeing an inflection point, a great society uh, moment, if you will, that will be a precursor to better performance for lower wage Chinese in the future. Um, assessment, indicators, policy discussion, and methodology. Those are the four routines that we're going to follow each quarter as we um, uh, produce this dashboard. We'll start with a quick take on how things went in labor policy reform in this period, in this quarter that we're looking at the data for. We will uh, look at the indicators, these, which I just showed you in some detail. We will then turn to look at the policy dynamics in that quarter, which may not be moving the needle yet, but if it's the right kind of policy discussion taking place, that should be a precursor to an improvement in these indicators going forward. And finally, of course, for each of these, we have a detailed methodology section um, for those wonks in the room who want to dig in and see how we, um, how we produce this magic. That's what Dashboard is and aspires to be. Um, we'll look forward to feedback from all of you, really, um, to fine tune a little bit around the margins um, for this um, in the years going ahead with the great hope uh, that this will be a shared resource of interest to Chinese and Westerners as well so that instead of just stabbing in the dark with 100-day plans, we actually have a 10,000-day perspective uh, on the underlying source of growth and China's potential to be a, uh, a productive, progressive contributor to the international system. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the panel. Come take a seat. Take a seat, guys. Good. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan. Good to see we got such a good roll up this morning. Uh, take a seat. Um, and uh, thank you for the overview for nerds and non-nerds alike. Uh, those of us who uh, really uh, enjoy questions of methodology, uh, put your hands up. Hey, I told you it was going to be a nerdy audience. Uh, and those of you who want the general vibe. Okay. See, it's eclectic gathering. I can tell you the percentage is exactly right now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Nerd back in your box, that's all I'd say. Dan Rosen. Uh, but it's, uh, it's uh, good to have you all with us uh, this morning. And uh, thank you, Josette, for your opening remarks. And Jack, for your support for this enterprise. It's been terrific. Just a word on this uh, panel. And we now have a good slice of time, about an hour, to run through uh, what uh, the diagnostics are beginning to tell us uh, on this central question of the future performance of the Chinese economy, on which all other things largely rest, largely rest. There is, for those of us who have been political practitioners in other domain, uh, it's called uh, the long dark nights of the soul called pure politics. Uh, that can disrupt any system. But by and large, the core performance of the economy shapes most things. And certainly in China's case, that's the same as Deng Xiaoping knew full well when he launched this enterprise nearly 40 years ago. Um, we are blessed with a great panel this morning. Um, uh, Dan Rosen now needs no introduction. Uh, he's introduced um, the beginnings of his work. But we're also joined by Evan Medeiros. Evan leads Eurasia Group's um, coverage of the Asia-Pacific. In June 2015, he stepped down for the position of Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Asian Affairs at the White House's National Security Council. Uh, in that role, he served as President Obama's top advisor on the Asia-Pacific and was responsible for coordinating U.S. policy towards the region across the areas of diplomacy, defense, economic policy, and intelligence affairs, and keeping Australia under control. <laughs> I just added that bit. The, um, apart from all that, apart from all that uh, he's an Aspie Senior Fellow, and uh, we welcome you here uh, this morning, Evan. 
who I've known for many years and is a seriously smart guy. Uh, Zhang Lanlan, or Lanlan Zhang, um, uh, is uh, vice chairman of CICC US Securities, uh, a wholly owned subsidiary of China International Capital Corporation Limited. Uh, previously, she was director and CEO of CICC US Securities. Lan Lan joined CICC's research department in 99. Uh, if you've been in the research department from back in 99, that makes you also a nerd. <laughs> okay. Yes, I love numbers. You love, <laughs> I love it when people say they love numbers. I think Jack does too, uh, in terms of providing light rather than heat to conversations, as Josette Sheeran often reminds us. Since then, she has served as the chief analyst of CICC's research department, the head of its sector research group, and its strategic research group. Um, uh, one or two thoughts from me before we get the conversation rolling. Uh, we've actually done a fair bit of scanning around the world to see who else is seeking systematically to follow uh, the progress or the regress of China's announced economic reform program of 2013. You might recall, those of you who are serious China nerds, uh, that this was uh, called at the time Dang de Jie Ding. It was, it was the decision of the party. And everyone simply referred to it as the decision. Okay. Uh, would that this applied in certain other countries every now and then. But the decision was taken, and outlining some 60 uh, policy directions for the future fundamental economic reform uh, of the country, for which the, the late motif was one highly contested statement, which said that, quote, uh, the uh, market shall now be the principal determinant of future Chinese economic governance, unquote. Well, it's a paraphrase, it's not an actual quote. Um, and uh, this was h highly contested, hotly debated before it was resolved. And underpinning so many of the policy uh, directions and policy uh, reform um, uh, projects, uh, which form part of Dan's uh, project together with the Asia Society, that we should always come back to as a fundamental question to test. Is that still the case? Is it being reflected? in these core 10 areas of reform, which uh, this project is specifically tracking, um, or are we beginning to see a departure? And the best way of testing that is not through policy declarations, not through political declarations, but as Jack Wadsworth reminded us before, through the hard disciplines of hard data, uh, which demonstrate the truth or falsehood of a given proposition. So I think uh, that is a core question for us uh, for the future. Um, the second, and I think uh, the presentation just before by Dan uh, on the role of innovation within the Chinese economy is critical. You know, there's a lot of folklore about uh, Chinese innovation. Nyah, they can't do it. Nyah, Con Confucian education system. Nyah, they just memorize everything. Nyah, no hope. End of story. Uh, go, to, go to Silicon Valley, QED, it's fixed. Um, it's a little different to that. Um, uh, what I think is fascinating uh, from the data is that it suggests movement um, from China's perspective and the world's perspective in a positive direction. Uh, what I also know from a general observation of China is whenever the Chinese leadership work out that they have a major problem in a particular area of the economy, uh, on policy, performance, uh, on execution, um, the habit of these guys, that's the Chinese leadership, and regrettably they are, they are virtually all guys, uh, is that they sit down, they analyse, uh, they look at where the deficiencies lie, and for the last five years you've had a major push on national innovation policy involving every serious economic think tank, every serious economic ministry in the country. And what is interesting is that, well, some of us thought this is just a paper exercise. Uh, this is sort of the things that um, communist parties do. Ah, we've got a problem with innovation. We'll set up another leading group on innovation. Uh, and there's a bit of a track record of things like that. But what is interesting, and I think the question which I'm going to enjoy particularly probing with Dan as we move through this morning's conversation, is what is actually happening with innovation? Um, because uh, if the Chinese are striking pay dirt, uh, if they are actually achieving the turnaround in the performance of firms, uh, and if that is going to be a serious driving dynamic for the future growth of the economy, wealth and employment, then I think we're about to enter into an entirely new world as far as China is concerned. So I look forward to probing that conversation as well. And finally, by way of um, acknowledgement and thanks, uh, is 
This is not uh, just Dan's own exercise. It's in partnership with the Asia Society Policy Institute. I'm the president. Um, but uh, the, the substantive collaboration on the part of our institution uh, with Dan has been through uh, Deborah Eisenham. Where are you, Deborah? She's probably off working. There she is, right up the back. Um, she has been Dan's partner from the get-go and all this, and I'd like to acknowledge you publicly, Deborah, for the core work you've undertaken. So let the discussion begin as he shuffles to the right. I might start uh, with one quick question to, um, uh, to uh, Dan before I move to Evan, um, uh, and then Lan Lan, and that is... Um, on the point I just made before about innovation and drawing off uh, your uh, single slide of data there, how confident uh, that are you that the data is robust about pointing uh, in a northerly direction in terms of innovation-based firms now producing a larger slice of total Chinese uh, gross domestic product? Uh, as robust as we can be, I would say. Um, whenever we're looking at uh, value-added output in Chinese data, we're using national accounts data. And this is interesting, actually. This is a problem both for China and for the United States. When you have a big share of new value-added coming from firms like Google that don't actually put a price on their service, we all consume it without there being a price out there to judge what's the value added of all this intangible output that's changing our lives that we use all the time. There's a lot of uh, backroom statistical uh, subjectivity on the part of their statistics bureau to put the right value on that. So for all of us, our innovative sectors aren't the kinds of industries that uh, national accounts folks came up with right, at, right after <laughs> World War II for how we count GDP. So, if anything, I would say the value-added weight of the innovative sectors in China is very significantly higher than the numbers that are shown on our screen. That's all. That would also be true, though, for the United States and for the European Union you and You mean because Japan. of the conservative methodology? Yeah, because of our inability to put a proper value on a lot of the high-value service sector uh, activity that is the most um, important uh, component of the sort of innovative industries model. We chose to only look, in fact, in that line, at industrial sector value added. Only the value from innovative um, uh, manufacturing companies, um, basically, not the service sector, to look at the share in that segment of the economy because the data is more reliable. If we also tried to impute values for the service sector stuff, and if, for example, you call finance an innovative industry, um, then the numbers would be really massively higher than they already are. So the methodology section is very important for helping people understand the choices we had to make along the way. We're quite honest and transparent about those problems. They're not unique to China. They're sort of a general accounting problem uh, in how we do these things. Um, but the key is to use the same apples-to-apples -apples approach for how we draw the American line and the Chinese line and change over time gives us a sense of whether things are stable or moving. So there's a lot that the, the, that the that section does get done, but there are things which everyone is still grappling with in terms of evaluating something as uh, uh, ineffable as innovation. Ineffable, I love the term. The, um, uh, so you're confident, uh, looking at the data generally, and in this particular sector, which I grant you is always uh, a methodological dilemma, for any central bureau, any bureau of statistics in any country, that we're not seeing with your early uptake uh, of the performance of innovation-based firms of data massaging uh, by the authorities. I mean, there is a bit of a history of this in China. We were all familiar with the with what's gone on before. Party announces decision, marvelous decision, general round of applause. Uh, five years later, oops, we'd better be able to demonstrate something good is happening. Yeah. And wacko, uh, Australian term, uh, which means <laughs> Positive surprise. Uh, uh, you then uh, you then have uh, you then have the data suddenly uh, heading north. Of course, the most notorious illustration of this in Chinese economic history is the Great Leap Forward. So let's put all that to one side. But you're seriously across uh, uh, the numbers here. 
Uh, so, again, I probe you. Uh, you're confident we are beginning to see that uptick. Yeah, we, we considered all those risks that we might have a false positive or a false negative in what we choose. And in one case, the land policy reform indicator, we had to acknowledge that the data was so bad that we could not offer a quarterly update. So that's one where it's not so timely, unfortunately, what our primary indicator says, because they just don't give us quarterly numbers. We only have annual data on change of land policy dynamics. You'll have to wait till next week to dig in um, to work with, with a lag. So we're kind of flying blind when it comes to land reform. But in terms of innovation, people will debate whether the level is where they would set the line, but the slope of change that's the same methodology being used quarter after quarter after quarter, and we have an accurate sense of the slope. Mm -hmm. It was very flat five years ago. Today, it's gotten quite steep. And if it stays on that trajectory, we're going to be talking about passing points uh, without too much doubt um, about the data we're using um, within the uh, foreseeable year or two. And Dan, uh, Evan, I might just get you to hold fire for one further second. I just wanted to pro Blanlan on the innovation question, given it's so central to your presentation this morning, but frankly against any broad analysis central to the economy's future. What do you uh, take of Dan's take on innovation? Um, do you um, support it given your own experience in your own... Um, uh, Don't worry. <laughs> uh, in your own uh, corporate environment, uh, but your own massaging of the numbers that you dearly love? based on your early confession publicly. Yeah, I think uh, that definitely uh, all the evidence we saw in China from a macro le micro level uh, does support uh, Dan's uh, uh, conclusion over there. I can give you some uh, evidence to support uh, why that was the case. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, very recently, uh, the two largest market cap uh, company with the largest uh, uh, capitalization uh, of a Chinese public listed companies they are all from uh, innovative sectors in comparison with uh, five years ago you probably look at that as state-owned enterprise financial sectors but today they are Tencent and uh, Alibaba so that number if uh, we don't know exactly the uh, slope but we definitely know the trend is supported and there is a reason behind that um, if you look at uh, what China has been doing after the financial crisis, they started the uh, what they call Jamboard uh, in the domestic listed uh, 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 Asia market. That gave a tremendous boost uh, for the uh, uh, innovative sectors company to be listed without a very stringent uh, profit uh, history. And that helps uh, a lot of the VC, uh, venture capital investment, a lot of the private equity investment uh, into that space, and that encouraged the growth. And secondly, if you look at what happened after the financial crisis, it was uh, the credit uh, expansion. And a significant part of the credit expansion also goes into um, building the competitiveness in the in innovative sector as well. And if you look at the next data, which is China every year has about 9 million uh, college graduates. And uh, there are a more significant uh, portion of those graduates actually from the STEM area. In fact, I would argue if you look at the next competitive place that China is going to emerge, it's, it may not be um, the labor intensive, the uh, lower cost uh, manufacturing space. It's actually going to be the lower engineering cost that will be coming from the, vast, uh, the massive provision of uh, uh, China STEM students. So their, their cost is still significantly la lower than the United States, than many other developed countries, probably one third, one fourth of the cost. That's where we saw this is not only a proven trend of history in the past few years, it's probably likely to be sustainable in the coming years as well. The, of course, what's happening in innovation, both in terms of data collection and also the observable behavior of individual firms, and we just mentioned Alibaba and Tung Xun, mm -hmm. uh, Tencent, the, um, is um, uh, all very fine and dandy. Um, 
But let me throw out again a couple of provocative points and then at this point uh, bring in uh, Evan. Uh, I said before that the key question is here is how's the market as a discipline continue, going to continue to perform in the overall Chinese economy? And if I could just throw out uh, two provocative propositions um, and then ask um, Evan's comment and the rest of you please dive in afterwards. Um, and these uh, go from the realm of hard data to uh, political economy. And that is, as I see it, um, state-owned enterprise reform um, may be slowing. Um, political reasons being, um, if you're from Xi Jinping's perspective and you're looking at a, a national employment challenge, and not just in the lead-up to the 19th Party Congress, but more, more broadly, um, do you want to have a continued third lever at your disposal as the National Economic Manager-in-Chief? Not just fiscal policy, thank you very much, they have that in the West. Not just monetary policy, thank you very much, they got that in the West. But I'd like industry policy as well, thank you very much, because that gives me an effective lever to influence direct employment in seasons of either global economic downturn or whatever, or, do or domestic um, uh, credit crunches. And so I begin to see the, um, the, the, the smoke signals uh, of a slowing of SOE reform. Now, I'd like to test that against a political question before we then go back to you on the data of the proposition. Uh, and the second thing I begin to see, and I've got uh, nothing other than uh, uh, a few reports to base this on, is um, more political constraints beginning to emerge for the operation of major private firms uh, in terms of the role of, um, let's call it, uh, party committees and party secretaries within private firms. That is, the underpinning assumption that you're out there in the marketplace as a bunch of Chinese private firms out doing your thing, and we, the party, are only interested in whether you're adding to GDP, adding to jobs and improving wages, uh, etc., is now the subject of some the beginnings of some signs of some level of political constraint. I may be wrong on both those propositions, but I've picked up some of the entrails. So, let me flip to Evan here in the unfolding uh, quintennial uh, event, uh, the Party Congress. How do you see those two questions, uh, Evan, and more broadly, the constraints and opportunities and post-Party Congress prospects for the furtherance or the slowing of the reform program announced in 2013? Thanks, Kevin. Great questions. Um, first, let me congratulate you and Dan. Uh, I think um, if there's one, one um, view that I came away from my time on the White House with, it's that it's essential to deal with China as it is, not as we wish it were or fear it may become. And the only way you do that, build a strategy around that approach, is to make sure that it's essentially data driven. And, you know, both in my time in government and now uh, during my time in the private sector dealing a lot with the global finance community, um, what I see is a lot of debates that are informed by excessive expectations or inordinate fears of what China might become. So a product like the dashboard is critical both for the private sector and the public sector to have an effective debate about where China is going. So kudos to you. I think this is an incredible, incredible public service. Um, but ultimately, uh, politics is going to determine the economic trajectory of China. Um, I don't think that a purely economic-oriented perspective, while a critical part of the discussion and data and numbers are essential, and you need to sort of be comfortable to have an informed discussion. I mean, ultimately, all economic policy decisions in China are political decisions. And so it's important to look at these two issues uh, in tandem to understand um, how to interpret the kind of excellent data that uh, Dan is going to be sharing with us on a quarterly basis. And there are a couple. Um, considerations that I would throw out for you to, uh, to think about. Number one uh, is time. I think time matters an enormous amount for China. And I think time is in short supply. 
if you believe, as I do, that China wants to avoid the middle income trap, and I believe that in part because Xi Jinping has told me one of the great virtues of working in a place like the National Security Council is you get to be in all these meetings between Obama and Xi and Li Keqiang, and I was in lots of them. And the Chinese government has been clear going all the way back to 2013 when Xi Jinping took over and when Obama and Xi sat down in Southern California in June of 2013 to begin sort of planning out the future of the U.S.-China relationship, there was an entire three and a half hour discussion about the economy. And Xi Jinping started out by describing what he saw as his principal economic challenge. He called it the Latin America trap. I think the rest of us will just call it the middle income trap. And here's the problem, is that is that China has been a middle income country for 25 years now. Now you can quibble with this figure a little bit, but let's, you know, for argument's sake, this is drawn from World Bank data. They've been a middle income country for 25 years. They probably only have about five years to graduate from middle income to upper income in order to uh, keep growing. And in terms of baseline, this is about the same amount of time that it took the other sort of newly emerging economies. It took South Korea 23 years as a middle income economy, Taiwan 27, Singapore 29, Korea 23. And of those 25 years for China, eight of them have been as a upper middle income economy. Um, and Hong Kong, Singapore, and the ROK spent seven years before they graduated from upper middle income to upper income. So in other words, China in the next five years needs escape velocity. It really needs things to pick up in the next five years if it's going to make that jump. And to put it in very numerical terms, and Dan please, and Lan Lan, please correct me, but China's per capita income, the sort of critical indicator, is about $8,700 per capita income in market exchange rate terms. It needs to get to 12,300 to graduate to an upper income economy. So time matters and China is running out of time. And the question is, can they adopt the kind of policy reforms necessary to boost productivity um, sufficiently, to grow sufficiently in order to break that barrier? And I think they're running out of time. Point number two, what will determine whether or not they adopt the policies necessary to do that, as Kevin rightly pointed out, is politics. Is Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, are they willing to pay the political cost necessary? And I would say the jury is still out on that. Obviously, the big disappointment, I would say, of the international community of analysts, policymakers, and financiers has been how little of the third plenum reforms have been realized. Um, it's, it's, from my perspective as a longtime China watcher, it's clear that in Xi Jinping's first term, he devoted his political capital to uh, anti-corruption, uh, party reconstruction and rectification, reform of the PLA, an incredibly costly political task. It doesn't get covered enough, but nonetheless, very, very difficult, and some aspects of foreign affairs. So I think in the second term, clearly he's going to focus more of his laser beam on the economy. The question is, is he willing to pay the political cost? And the way I look at it is, I don't think Xi Jinping necessarily is a reformer. I think he is a modernizer. And the reason that distinction is critical is because Xi Jinping's views about the economy are informed by a series of let's call them Leninists and nationalist political beliefs, not a full-throated embrace of the market. So I think what we're going to see in the next five years is a tension play out between those nationalist Leninist beliefs and market forces, and which, uh, which are going to prevail. The kind of beliefs I'm talking about are things like the importance of party control and centralized decision making, number two, a decreased reliance on foreign technology. Three, reducing exposure to external risks, especially global markets. Four, setting global rules and standards, especially in industries where China wants to be a global leader. ICT is the most obvious example. And number five, building global brands across different sectors. 
And those beliefs, adherence to those beliefs, do not lead you to a firm, complete embrace of the market. It doesn't lead to a full implementation of, of third plenum reforms. What it leads you to is a very mixed picture, where on the one hand, uh, in order to stem systemic risks, for example, in order to reform the financial sector to prevent an immediate economic heart attack, I think you're going to see a much more robust embrace of the market. But when it comes to things like the exchange rate and capital account, because of the beliefs that I talked about, much more likely to be a very gradual incremental approach, which hold back certain aspects of the ability for China to um, rebalance to consumption and services and ultimately embrace innovation. So there'll be some market forces. I think you're likely to see a, a, a greater space and role for the private sector, probably more foreign investment liberalization. But on the other, other hand, th these sets of beliefs also inform an embrace of the market, a market in the form of industrial policy. Look no further than Made in China 2025, right? This is a document that outlines a blueprint for sectors where China wants to be a global leader. China wants to set global standards for telecoms or cloud computing. China wants to build global brands. But it doesn't want to do it by letting the private sector run free, though there's some of that clearly, especially in ICT. But it's, uh, it's industrial policy. It's um, the, ultimately the state, uh, through directed lending, making allocations of winners and losers in order for China to become a global leader in robotics and innovation and cloud computing, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, electric vehicles, um, uh, batteries, et cetera. So there is going to be a, a very intense negotiation process between these political beliefs and market forces um, to determine how quickly or, or what that curve looks like. I mean, Dan's absolutely right. I mean, the growth and reform curve is now a positive trajectory. But here's the question. How steep is that trajectory? And also importantly, how linear is that trajectory? In other words, is it two steps forward, one step backward? Or is it four steps forward, one step backward? So the, the shape of that curve and the linearity of that curve matter. And it matters in particular because of my first point, which is time. He said all that from that. <laughs> That's what we call American haiku. <laughs> the, um, that was pretty impressive. The, um, so going back to the core question, which has animated both sets of contributions uh, in terms of, let's call it, the pure economic data and what I describe as legitimate commentary of political economy, and the, the rolling analytical challenge of anything to do with the Middle Kingdom is to harness both. Um, what does the data tell us about the core question that, um, of, let's call it, the future role of the market versus, let's call it, state industrial policy? I put out two points before about the future independence of private firms and about the role of uh, SOEs, uh, which Evan completely ignored. Um, in his, uh, in his answer, but I'm glad you did because we learned a whole lot of other things as well. Um, what's the data telling us uh, on this question? Um, and, um, and your reflections on that as well, Lan Lan. Dan. It's very hard to, the term we would use in economics is operationalize some of these concepts like devotion to private participation in the marketplace. Very, very tricky to tease that out with numbers that can be objective and, and we can go back to. Um, Hence, you know, on, on a lot of these big philosophical questions, Dashboard won't offer any easy answer. But with regard to these questions of the state sector and the private sector, um, several of our, um, uh, our lenses offer some pretty useful perspective. On state-owned enterprise reform, right, looking closely at the third plenum program, we don't see complete commitment to withdraw the state from the economy. What we see is commitment to withdraw the state from those parts of the economy which are better organized with market principles. So to, to expect to see state withdrawal across the whole line, would, you, you would say, ah, not happening, failure. Instead, what we do in our SOE tracker, policy tracker, one of the 10 clusters is SOE uh, policy or state-owned enterprise policy, is we separate 
industries into those where the state intends to stay put, and they think that it has to continue to be state related, and those which they've said more or less definitively, the market should be doing this one. There's really no reason for the state to stay in this game. And we look at those two separated pools of industries and look at the state's share of all revenue by listed firms in those separate industry clusters. We, we don't expect the state logic industry set to see a reduction of, of the state's presence. In fact, as a proportion of GDP? Yeah, uh, uh, as a percentage of all revenues earned in that industry, in Pardon. that sector. But in aggregate, you, you can't reach a conclusion? Well, look, I mean, we can, what we can see is all revenues earned by all firms and all industries that are listed companies. We have listed company data. We don't have data on companies that are not listed. So if we look at those industries where the state has said power distribution, we're not going to do an Enron. Thank you very much for the alternative. We're going to keep it state related. There's no reason to expect the state share of all revenues among power distribution companies to fall. To look at that would be a false indicator you're looking for. In, re in retail, on the other hand, there's still a bunch of central SASEC control, these are big state-owned enterprises at the central level, that have a lot of assets in retail and wholesale. There's no logic in anybody's development experience that says that should really main, remain state you know, state oriented. We should have friendship stores instead of Macy's. It doesn't work. So in that cluster of industries, we expect to see state withdrawal. We've seen some over the past five years, but now it's kind of moving sideways, it's flat, and we're not seeing the teasing apart of those two um, sets. For private sector, we have a whole nother lens here that looks at competition policy regimes in China to ask whether there's evidence of the state proactively stepping in and making sure that separate but equal is actually equal <laughs> for private sector firms, right? There needs to be a kind of uh, you know, affirmative action for the private sector or no private sector firm is going to be on an equal footing with a state company in China, I don't think. So we have a whole bunch of competition-related metrics. First and foremost, uh, well, not first and foremost, but one of the most germane to your question is number of new business starts and number of business failures in a given quarter. That entry and exit is the life, is the key metric of any competitive system and economy, I would say. Dave, yeah. Kevin, could I jump in here? Of course, in a haiku so, form. <laughs> so Dan, going back to your um, disaggregation of different types of SOE, SOEs, could you, could you give us a sense of, um, if you believe that Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang are really committed to rebalancing the Chinese economy. Um, what would you expect to see in SOE reform, and what would you not expect to see? Because I, I absolutely agree with your point that too often privatization and market exit, really high standards for SOE reform, are held out as the key mm. metric. But I think we can both agree, and I know because Dan and I are old friends and we've had this conversation a million times, that the credit intensity of growth is a huge structural problem for China that weighs on its ability to avoid the middle income trap and prevent sort of the gradual decline of growth. Could you tell us a little bit about what you've seen from the data in the past and what you would expect to see in the future if they were trying to reduce the credit intensity of growth and what you would not expect to see if they weren't. In other words, what are, what are two different trajectories mm -hmm. that we should be looking out for so when we look at this data in the next quarter and the following quarter, we have a sense of what it's telling us? Good nerdy question. I, I'll try to just do last 60 seconds on that. I want to hear what Landland thinks about it because she's thought deeply about that as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, in looking at the SOE policy choice that stands before China today, the first part of that has already been taken. The center has said to the provinces, you tell us which industries should be commercially driven and left to the market, the state should withdraw, and which the state needs to stay in. You give us your pr preliminary answer to that. We'll take stock of all your answers. Then we'll an announce a national scheme for separating between we'll always be state and then a middle category that's like, we'll be state until they can stand on their own because we're very weak compared to poor, you know, big Boeing will beat us up if we don't support uh, AVIC, uh, this kind of thing. And then the third sector, the salt monopoly, which really don't have to have the central government doing salt in China today. 
They've already privatized they've, salt. They've done it for 3,000 3, years. 3,000 years, you know, work pretty good. <laughs> Um, they're about 50 years behind India in terms of privatizing the ability to make salt and taking away from the British Raj, right? But they got there this year. They actually did privatize salt. So they've said to the provinces, you tell us where the state has to keep its grip. They've got all those answers back. There was some hope that at the, Nas at the, at the, people, at the National uh, People's Congress this past spring, they would elaborate that into a national scheme. They chose not to. And so we're still waiting for this demarcation between where the state has to stay and where the state will be pulled out. Once they do that, we'll start to see these lines of who makes the profit change really quickly. And that will be the acid test of them actually getting that job done. That's the way we're looking at it. Name, okay. name, name the date that that will happen. <laughs> I would, I'll make a bet that within the next 12 months, they will announce that national scheme for distinguishing between what will be persistently state interest industries, and the first tranche, anyway, of those that can be now left to the market. So you heard it. 100 bucks? 20 bucks Australian. 20 bucks. And, uh, <laughs> oh. Hey, I grew up in a Presbyterian household. Oh. You know, we bet modestly, if, if at all. I'm going to need some leverage in this bet, okay. Jack. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll do it together, Jack. The bottle, the bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, that'll be worth more than 100 bucks. The uh, Jack's bottle of wine. The um, Lan Lan, your yeah. take on this market question. So I want to uh, contribute maybe two points here. One is um, how to look at China not just as one country, but look at China as a um, country probably of two parts. One is the really developed part, east coastal part, may have already leapfrogged the uh, uh, middle income trap. Uh, they are on a pretty healthy growth itself, uh, both re, you know, benefit from the global trade, but in the meantime, also they have already built a healthy uh, reliance of its uh, domestic consumption already. Then the other part is actually pretty far from getting to the mi middle income level. Uh, that's more of the Western part. The question for China is how we can grow the Western part, the more less developed part, uh, the less developed part of China. So my experience, very interesting, at very beginning of my career, I was a telecom analyst. So I literally went through the state-owned uh, enterprise reform uh, at the last run. And in the meantime, I was uh, also challenged by, at a certain stage, like whether China will be able to reach the same penetration as uh, what we have seen in the United States and in other countries, because you started to get worried about uh, this rural-urban difference, this east and west <coughs> difference. So when China, so at the time, uh, my analytics uh, told me China will never, probably will never be able to reach the same penetration as other more developed countries because of the income gap over there. But guess what? China's penetration curve is exactly the same as what you have seen in other countries. And the reason that they were able to do that was uh, they were able to uh, reach the economy of scale and being able to bring down the handset costs and the network equipment costs. So that allows people on the West to be able to enjoy the same uh, you know, services. And the, today, China's penetration is as high as any other country. So what? not every industry was able to go through that kind of a penetration curve. But for those where we pass um, the initial penetration difficulty, we're seeing the curve quite similar as other country. So I think two things I want to remind is that, one, you have to look at China as a four times of the market, probably, mm -hmm. eventually, of the United States because of the population difference and will allow us to build a much bigger economy of scale. So the cost curve with China's participation in the global trade uh, market is going to be tremendously difficult from today's cost level. So you, if you look at what today's mar uh, market cost number to think about where China is going, probably you're going to miss what that uh, uh, going to be look like. That's one lesson I learned when I was looking at uh, uh, China's telecom market. So I want to say, try to look at China differently 
And that may give you some uh, uh, tolerance on the time front. So that's one area. And the other, coming back to the state-owned enterprises uh, reform, um, for a long time, I would have to say, after 2013, when we start to have the decision, there was really a very high expectation about the SOE reform. And I have to admit that the market has been quite disappointed uh, in terms of the speed. However, um, if you go back and look at what was the difficulty, I think the challenge uh, on one hand is between market and China's leadership, probably in some of the industry policies uh, uh, in the global market. But I think on the other hand, it also has to do with uh, when the new administration stepped on the stage in 2012, the difficulty <coughs> they encountered at the time probably is quite different from what the market has been thinking. You know, I think the difficulty was they look at the market, they feel that they have to do something with the corruption immediately. It has to do with income gap. You know, China, I think back then, after a tremendous uh, success in the economic growth, however, on the other hand, we were facing a very serious issue on income gap. And I don't think that's something, hopefully, you know, it's not going to be very easy to be changed with just a very short-term uh, labor policy because you want China to remain competitive in the global market. But on the other hand, how you can boost uh, your consumption capability uh, for the lower income uh, group of people. I think the changing industry policy, labor policy is one hand, but on the other hand, with it, what I think probably the market has not recognized is the government start to uh, have the, what they call the help the poor policy. They actually, uh, I think that's the probably advantage of uh, um, a state-owned e economy. They were able to direct the resources to help the poor in a very short period of time. So, for example, like our company uh, has been required, requested, um, you know, good or bad, that could be not market driven, but on the other hand, requested to go to the countryside, pick a county, help them, not only just with the financial resources, but help them to build uh, their local economy, help to, them to build the, the companies and bring in the capital. I mean, that's something we feel tremendously helpful to help that one particular county. And that happened not only with our company, but also some uh, other state-owned uh, companies as well. So I, what I'm saying is that at the time, when they look at the state-owned enterprise reform, because of the concern of income gap, and because of what they have seen in the last round of state-owned enterprises reform, um, they were so worried about you know, whether the reform uh, what the market want them to pursue, for example, giving the state-owned enterprises incentive, for example, uh, change the ownership or increase private ownership, whether that will increase the income gap in the economy, which they feel at the time that they need to urgently address first. So I think that's probably why, maybe I'm wrong, I'm not, I was not a political scientist over there, but I think that might be why it was a bit slower than people thought. Hmm. However, uh, the, the fortunate part is that in the last 12 months, we actually started to see some positive mo movement. And then I was discussing about what we have seen uh, one of the listed companies in China called Yunnan Bai Yao. This is a local owned, uh, state owned enterprise. Uh, they have gone through. Yunnan Bai Yao. Bai Yao. Yao. Bai Yao. Yeah, so, it's, a, uh, it's Yunnan province. It's their best uh, uh, state owned enterprise. And they went in, they allow uh, a private owner to uh, buy 50% uh, of the company. They changed the board structure. They changed the relationship between the management and the board, which I saw very positive uh, in that uh, mm -hmm. uh, area. Of course, uh, China Unicom is a very recent one, have gone through the mixed ownership uh, uh, reform. So I see positive signs. I see things are moving. And also, I think when you look at the China state-owned enterprises, there are actually two tiers, and the two tiers are behaving very differently. You have the central government-owned, and I think those companies are 
the state champion. They run actually financially uh, pretty well. If you look at the best run uh, iron and steel company, it's a boss deal. You look at their past the cash flow, even in a difficult market, they were able to run positive cash flow. So uh, I think those are unlikely to be changed in a very short term. However, if you go into uh, the provincial owned, uh, state owned enterprises, those are the areas depend on each physical situation of each different uh, province. Okay. That likely to change more. I'm mean, just, just to point out that when buyout very, very changes, briefly, I want to go to the yeah, US. when buyout changes hands and becomes less than 50 percent government owned, its share of profit in pharmaceutical flips in our chart from state owned to private, and that's what moves the needle. Okay. So multiply that times 100 firms, 500 firms, and that's what this is going to mean in terms of what we're tracking. Okay, I'm conscious of the time here. We've got at best about um, 10 minutes or so for questions. I'm going to take a group of questions and then throw it back at the panel. But so far, middle income trap, uh, central preoccupation of Xi Jinping. Interesting he used the term uh, Latin American trap. Obviously has read carefully the history of that continent, both economic and political. You say time running out. Lan Lan says, uh, look at Shanghai in the east versus uh, Qinghai in the west. Uh, a tale of two cities, a tale of two provinces, a tale of two middle income traps. Um, and a standing bet here in terms of when uh, the tablets of, tablets of stone will be handed down on which will be uh, allowed to remain in the state sector, which will be privatised, and a good addition from Lan Lan, which is look at the difference between SOEs nationally and at a provincial and sub-provincial level, which has always been my prejudice. Some questions, please. Um, can I uh, start, uh, uh, if we can make them very short two or three sentence questions, and this one here, then there, then there, then there, then there, that's five, and I'm going to literally then throw it back at uh, the, the panel. Yeah. Joan Kaufman from Schwartzman Scholars. And my question is really about the larger policy context. Um, I would uh, sort of disagree about the health and education investment because I think China's done a pretty good job of sort of reforming the health care and, you know, nine-year compulsory education. But the problem is the HUCO system, which you all alluded to. And what are the prospects? I mean, this is a major issue of inequality and of the labor system reform, which seem to be kind of under underpinning okay. of many of these questions. What do you think are the prospects for HUCO reform, you know, and um, the cities obviously don't want it, but the big cities, but okay. uh, it clearly is a, a critical issue. We'll come to HUCO reform. A uh, hardy perennial in any Chinese uh, economic debate and social debate. Uh, over here. Uh, no, behind you. Um, yes, I'd like the panel to zoom out a little bit. Could you identify yourself? Oh, sorry. Lyric Hughes-Hale from Chicago. Yeah. Um, I would like the panel to zoom out a little bit. There, the world that we live in now is different than the world in which Taiwan, Japan, Korea uh, escaped the middle income trap. Productivity, wage growth, all of those things are depressed, not just in China, but as Dan's wage growth uh, chart showed. And Evan, as you mentioned, credit and credit concerns, th these are global issues. In addition, China faces some specific headwinds, freedom of expression, which I think is uh, essential for innovation, intellectual property issues, maybe constraints on Chinese investment overseas. Could you address some of these issues that might affect innovation policy in China? Good. Thanks very much, Lyric. Uh, gentleman here. Thank you. Earl Carr representing uh, Momentum Advisors. Um, can you talk and describe who are the proponents for advocating economic market oriented economic reforms in China and who are those within the Chinese elite that are resisting those changes? Mm -hmm. If we could have their address as well and their phone numbers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I only have the emails and, and the WeChat accounts. Okay, we'll stop right there. Okay, a gentleman with a very distinguished gray beard. Thank you. I'm Charlie Kimball with the Korea Center for National Finance. Uh, I was wondering to what extent uh, China is moving away from let the market rule and Lan Lang sometime to some extent address that in terms of um, inequality of incomes. Um, I was thinking in particular about uh, <coughs> negative externalities, in particular pollution. 
and and should these two things and and developments in this area be reflected in the dashboard? Good question. And there was one other chap here. Yes, chap with the pink tie. Thank you. Uh, Mark Hanna, New York University. Uh, I have a question about theory, actually. Um, I heard uh, Kevin Rudd say something about economics permeating other aspects of uh, uh, the, the China's political culture. And then uh, Evan Madero said that, that the politics is sort of determinative of China's economy. So I want to ask, without sort of si sidestepping and saying it's all cyclical, um, what, what do you think is determinative here? What do you think is primary uh, versus secondary between politics economics, culture, innovation, these kinds of things. Um, okay. I, it, there seemed to be some tension there. That sounds like a summarize the history of the Western novel in 30 seconds, but uh, <laughs> we'll come back to that. It's a great question. So we've got five Four. questions. I will arbitrarily uh, provide the division of labor. <laughs> uh, and so um, on um, health, uh, on the future of the hukou system, who wants to answer that? Hukou? Yeah. Okay, hukou for you. Uh, Lyric's question about, um, let's call it other external constraints to innovation, uh, freedom being the, the core <laughs> question, which is the free flow of information essential to a capitalist economy, doubly essential in the, in the innovation sector. Over to you, uh, Evan. Um, then we had... Uh, Earl's question and reformers. Uh, yep. I've got the who question, so you can do that one. Um, because it's massively politically sensitive. Um, <laughs> uh, the, um, the role of uh, pollution as an externality in properly evaluating, that so goes to your methodology. Um, and then uh, the last question was on the, uh, what was the last question? Oh, yeah, on theory. Yeah, yeah, so I'll answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, prob I'll probably throw to this guy as well. And I'm going to give you the last shout. Okay. okay, because um, you've so instrumental to all that we're discussing this morning. So in that order, over to you, Lana. Okay, so for the hukou system, actually um, China is already undergoing some changes in the hukou system already for the third and fourth tier city. Keep these short responses uh, it, too. It's already mm. uh, happening, not at the uh, uh, very developed uh, cities like Beijing, Shanghai, is, uh, you know that if we open that up, immediately everybody will be probably flowing into those cities that create another set of uh, problems. My assumption is that we'll see <coughs> the living cost in those cities to go even higher. They pro I wouldn't be surprised in the future that uh, living in Beijing and Shanghai would be more expensive than probably New York. If that's happening, then the hukou system itself is not going to be a big issue anymore. So I think that will be solved based on economics. But we're already seeing that happening in a smaller city. Okay, thanks. Freedom and, uh, and innovation. L Lyric, great question. So my view is um, actually China faces a pretty challenging external environment for accomplishing the kind of tasks that I talk about to avoid the middle income trap. Um, you pointed out the investment environment. I mean, given where global politics is going, the rise of populism, but more specifically anti-establishment politics, the growing resistance uh, within the U.S. and the EU for accepting more Chinese investment, which runs against a lot of the different strategies that Xi Jinping has to move up the value-added industrial chain, I think that's very problematic for him. I think the global financial cycle uh, isn't helping. We're clearly entering into a tightening period, whether it's uh, gradually rising Fed rates or un unwinding of the QE, admittedly, fairly modestly. I think that that uh, puts pressures on all EMs and especially EM cur currencies like the renminbi. We'll have to see what happens to the dollar, but I think that's, that's pretty challenging for them. On the trade front, um, I think uh, even though aggregate external demand has sort of resumed in the 2016 period, you know, trade and trade liberalization is sort of, it's, it's on life support, right? WTO and the Doha round are dead. In terms of major, major regional agreements, RCEP isn't going anywhere fast. TPP 11 is sort of the bright shining light. And there doesn't seem to be much appetite within the EU. So in terms of China's ability to you know, use external demand as at least not a growth driver, but something that provides nice froth on the top so they can accept more costs in terms of 
um, structural reforms, I think that's pretty hard for China. On the freedom innovation question, I'm sort of of two views because the political scientist in me tells me you need, you know, a um, uh, you know, a true legal system, an independent judiciary, you need a free media, all of the structural elements to have true innovation. But here's the reality. China is innovating. China has enormously innovative companies. You know, um, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent are the obvious examples. And one of the reasons why is because China's external mar uh, internal market is so big. So they don't actually, you know, they don't perhaps need to rely on the traditional innovative processes because what they do is they develop a technology, they deploy it in one province, which by the way is the size of the entire market of Mexico, deploy it, test it, revise, deploy it again. And so there's sort of an indigenous um, sort of uh, mechanism that they can use for innovation that seems to have allowed them to skirt around some of these broader forces. Now how long that is sustainable? I just, I simply don't know. I think we're in, I think political science is in terra incognita here. And then briefly, Earl, great, great question. The sort of the statement behind your question is that we're in the old days of their reformers and their state people. And I don't think we're in that world anymore in China. I think there are people that simultaneously hold um, views about certain problems that are best solved by the market and certain problems that are best solved by the state. So yes, I do think people like Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang recognize that there are certain aspects of the economy, there are certain sectors that need greater exposure to market forces in order to become globally competitive. I think at the same time they also, also think that the state needs to dominate sectors. So you can't, I don't think it's this sort of Manichaean debate between Deng Xiaoping on the one hand and sort of Chen Yun on the other hand. Those debates are long gone in China. I mean, I think that take somebody like, you know, the classic, the quintessential market reformer, Zhou Xiaochuan. I think, you know, if you asked him, should China liberalize its capital account, you know, within a year, he'd probably say no. Mm. If you ask him how to approach the market exchange rate, I think he would, he would probably take a fairly conservative view about moving toward a more flexible exchange rate, but not yet a market-determined exchange rate. So I, I sort of, you really have to go issue by issue to understand the different preferences. I think the Manichaean debate is over. Okay, end of Manichaean debates. Um, the, uh, does uh, the series deal with the environmental externality? If not, why not? Please answer for yourself. Yeah. Uh, what, to bridge to, to that from what Evan winded up saying, you know, black cat, white cat, it doesn't matter as long as it catches mice. We will never end debates about what, what pace of capital account opening is optimal for a country. The IMF doesn't agree within itself. The answer, we do agree of what success looks like when you have stable capital flows that can go across the border without the government having to step in every two years. So we're not looking at the doctrinal debates within the fund and everywhere else. We're looking at the outcomes. Have they created a stable outcome? Ten different areas, one of which is environmental policy reform. Beijing has stated for uh, every possible reason that if it does not arrest the deterioration of environmental outcomes, no matter what your preferred strategy is for doing that, the place is going to implode. There is no future for China that does not entail radically changing the trend line. We look at two as our primary indicator, basic air quality, PM 2.5, and basic surface water quality, both of which there is ubiquitous, highly reliable data on levels of emissions and how bad they are relative to international <laughs> basic standards. It's very much part of the dashboard. Environment, none of these by themselves is the one single key to China's future. All of them, in fact, have to be um, turned in the right direction. And on the final question uh, by the resident theorist from NYU. Um, we have a political scientist to my right, we have an economist to my near left, we have a financial market analyst to my further left, and I'm simply an area studies guy, graduate in Chinese language and history, and with a sub-major in Chinese poetry, which was, always, <laughs> which was always my weak suit. And so here's my uh, broad 30-second haiku response. One, uh, culture determines that which is uh, possible uh, within any uh, set of... Um, uh, civilizational circumstances. 
Uh, it def defines uh, subconsciously and then consciously the parameters for acceptable behavior. You see this throughout Chinese history. And so the cultural overlay to what we would describe as objective forms of political and economic and financial behavior uh, is substantial in any culture. Here in the United States, you're just unconscious of it uh, because uh, the culture is taken as a given. We're conscious of these cultural factors in China because mm. it's external and foreign to us. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, both financial and economic uh, factors or determinants effect effectively describe a large part of what the political process can do. Um, and uh, this goes to the heart, for example, of um, China's attitude to future defence expenditure. Uh, how much can it afford in the future? These are now real debates within the Chinese system against reform of the hukou system and against the reform, for example, of social welfare more generally. But politics as its own internal Machiavellian condition uh, is as alive and well for both uh, cultural, traditional cultural and current um, intrinsically political factors uh, if you simply look at uh, the internal dynamics of Politburo politics today in the lead up to the 90th Party Congress, um, it is uh, opaque, uh, <coughs> intrinsically um, Machiavellian, um, as it has been throughout, throughout Chinese history, depending on the different political uh, structures of the time. So uh, the uh, poor man's answer to your theoretical question is yes, yes, and yes. Um, all three are determinants of objective uh, behaviour. But I think um, finally about um, China, the, I think if there are two ultimate organizing principles for me and how the Chinese state deliberates on itself at the moment, uh, which uh, subsume that classical the theoretical distinction to three forms. It's frankly the, the unifying ticket between Chen Yun and Deng Xiaoping and their contemporary uh, non-equivalence uh, is Chinese nationalism, uh, Fu Chia, uh, and what makes China wealthy and what makes China powerful. Uh, and secondly, the overarching determinant uh, is uh, the party forever. Um, and that is the conclusion that uh, the Communist Party is not simply a passing phase of Chinese um, political evolution, but in their own consciousness of it, uh, is to be entrenched on a continuing basis as the ultimate vehicle for political control. A strong party, a prosperous country, and a powerful country in the world, I think these are in fact the, uh, the coordinates for the internal discussion among Chinese elites in recent times. Folks, thank the panel. <laughs>